Growing up in the 80s and 90s, I've had the pleasure of seeing video games transform in a way that no other generation ever will. And I do feel lucky because of this. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not one of those, life was so much better back then, or kids today will never understand blah 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 guys. Even as a primarily nostalgia-driven content creator, I'm well aware of how dangerous nostalgia can be, and I actually really hate all that stuff. In many ways, seeing the massive leaps in technology from the Atari 2600 to what we have on modern PCs now only makes me jealous of what young people today will get to experience long after I've become too old to accept anything new as something positive. Now, there are many truly iconic games from the 90s that hold both a special place in my heart, but also transform the face of gaming in the process. Maybe they weren't the first to do what they did, but they did it so well that they became the standard by which all others would be measured against even going on to have entire genres named after them. And it's one of those iconic titles, and it's less iconic, but for me, equally nostalgic sequel I'd like to talk about today. Developed by a small French studio called Delphine Software, and helmed by visionaries like Paul Cuisy, the first game especially really solidified the idea of the cinematic or narrative platform game. If you're here because you've walked the same roads as I, and already know what's about to go down, well, to quote a greater man than I will ever be, I'd like to invite you to pull up your easy chair, and get a tall glass of iced tea, and enjoy the show. If you're somehow here despite having never played either of these games, well, it's with the greatest pleasure that I'd like to introduce to you, Conrad Hart. And without further preamble, let's get into the first game. This is Flashback. Flashback initially released for the Amiga 500 in 1992, which is actually the format I finished my first playthrough on. It was however designed for the Sega Mega Drive, and due to its incredible critical reception and massive commercial success, it got ported onto everything from PC CD-ROM to Atari Jaguar. Never had one of these. I don't really feel like I missed out on much if I'm being honest. The footage you see here has been collected from the remaster that was released a couple of years ago at the time of writing and is an absolute joy to play as it's basically the same game with some updated audio tracks, cleaned up graphics and a rewind feature to help you cope with the brutal difficulty spike that starts when you enter the death tower and simply doesn't stop until you hit the end game. Now look. I paid my dues. Back in the day, I did this the old-fashioned way. But given I'm lucky enough to be in my late 30s and have yet to encounter a single grey hair, I'm more than happy to embrace this feature in the interest of keeping my blood pressure to a reasonable level. This remaster is everything you could want from one. I think the only thing that's not as good is some of the sound design. The gun especially sounds a lot weaker, but most everything else is just perfect. It's harder than you'd imagine for me to cast my mind all the way back to that time in my life and get all the details correct, but I'd have most likely encountered Flashback for the first time on either a show called Games Master that featured the late great Patrick Moore, or another called Bad Influence. I definitely had reviews of the game in magazines, and back then, I could not have been more excited. Having cut my teeth on games like Sonic, Streets of Rage, and Revenge of Shinobi, and become a master of all of these. Well, I mean, I had to play Shinobi on easy and use the infinite shuriken cheat, but mm, that's semantics. I was well into the side-scrolling platform, but for a kid back then, Flashback really was a wonder to behold. With its unique sprite art, realistic rotoscoped animations, and cutscenes that were like nothing I'd witnessed before on any other home gaming platform. I'd had a chance to rent and even borrow my friend's Mega Drive cartridges of the game and dip my toes in the water. So you can imagine my joy when looking through a massive collection of unboxed floppy disks that had arrived in my house along with an Amiga 500 the Christmas before, when I found this and fired it up. Things go from 0 to 100 pretty fast, or at least as fast as animation made back in that time could be handled. But we are treated to this wonderful opening, 
as we see Conrad pounding leather down a corridor with lasers blasting into the walls all around him. And it only gets better from here. Our desperately escaping hero leaps aboard a flying motorcycle. I mean, can you imagine what it's like as a 10 year old watching this? And is chased through the skies by his relentless pursuers, who finally land the fatal hit that sends Conrad spiraling down into some kind of untamed jungle. Whoever our enemy is clearly didn't read the part of the evil villain's handbook that specifically states the hero isn't dead unless their severed head is presented to you. And even then it's touch and go if we're being honest. But they make a cursory scan of the area and depart, leaving Conrad to come to and for our game to start. So our story basically follows our protagonist after escaping from his unknown enemies and after he finds this little box on the floor not far from where he crashed, he gets a message not too dissimilar from the one Schwarzenegger receives at the start of Total Recall. His name's Conrad, he's an intelligence agent, and if he's watching this it's because they got to him and took his memory. So Conrad gets the objective of getting to his friend Ian in New Washington and has to navigate a jungle full of pits, mutants and annoying little security drone things to try to piece together everything he needs to make it into the city. Once Conrad is able to connect with Ian, Ian sets him up in this very handy Total Recall style chair which is able to reconstruct Conrad's lost memories and give us a bigger idea of what's going on. The gist is that Conrad had discovered that the human population of New Washington had been infiltrated by shape-shifting aliens, creatures known as the Morphs, mainly for their ability to assume human shape, but also because, well, I mean, look at them. His snooping caught their attention, and rather than simply killing him, this species that is intent on wiping out humanity for reasons unknown simply did a snatch and grab on him and wiped his memory after which they left him alone long enough for him to enact a daring escape, which effectively brings us back around to the start of the game. And that's really all there is to it. Evil aliens and a couple of lone agents fighting what seems to be a massive conspiracy that places them on the radar of almost every cop in New Washington. Conrad eventually escapes to Earth by winning a Running Man style game show called Death Tower and after some twists and turns gets zapped over to the Morph homeworld where he discovers they're actually connected into a hive mind via a master brain. Which is quite a convenient weak point for an enemy that is basically an entire species to have and one which our hero exploits to his best advantage. The game ends with the destruction of the Morph homeworld and Conrad floating in space in a ship too far from Earth to be able to chart a course home. He places himself in suspended animation and drifts, maybe forever, in the cold vacuum of space. Flashback is a side-scrolling cinematic platform game that takes place across several environments crafted from diverse color palettes with really solid visual aesthetics and hand-drawn backgrounds. That is to say, rather than being built out of repeatable tile sets like most 2D games of the era, each area was drawn by hand with minimal repetition. It exists of course, but there is something unique about every background in this game. We open in the untamed jungle into which Conrad fell from his bike, and wow, this opening scene. The people making this really knew what they were doing. A moment like this in 16-bit games is somewhat akin to stepping out of a vault for the first time in a Bethesda Fallout game. To put it simply, this is your big chance to suck your players in, so you've got to pull out all the stops while still having something special to show people down the line. As well as getting an eyeful of these gorgeously rendered hand-drawn backdrops, we also get to see Conrad's fluid rotoscoped animations in all their glory. And man, can this guy move. Between running, jumping and climbing, Conrad's mobility is almost on a par with Lara Croft's, and this is years before we'll see the likes of her on our screens. To say nothing of how badass he looks when he busts out his gun and assumes his combat stance. The combat in this opening level is just right, in that it's more of a puzzle than a fight. Enemies die with one shot and have one hell of a reaction to getting hit that makes firing your gun really satisfying. 
Some enemies require you to change levels to hit, but the big difference here as opposed to the later game is Conrad only has his standard shield. This is his life system and can absorb a total of four shots, but you will react just as violently as your enemies to being hit. So don't think you can just stand around tanking bullets and everything will be fine. The shield can be recharged at handy points throughout the game and, well, I hope you like this animation because, oh boy, are you going to be seeing a lot of it. What this means though, is that your main goal is more about getting the drop on enemies, which is something you'll be trying to do a lot all through this game. Arrive in the right place at the right moment, and they'll be eating dirt before they've had chance to ready their weapons. Make a mistake here, and you'll be kissing the dirt yourself, and scrubbing a charge off your shield while trying to remember where the last recharge spot was. The game also has several modes of instant death, from falling too far to fire traps and areas of the floor that are electrically charged. The latter are quite the problem in the first level, as they don't really stand out that much from the rest of the background. Safe points are also scarce and spaced out, so while this level is the easiest of all, it's getting you used to the idea that this game isn't going to play nice with you. But once all the pieces of the puzzle have been assembled, Conrad gets his anti-gravity belt and takes the trip down into New Washington, which, I guess, is a subterranean city? Well, he makes the trip in style. New Washington is probably the game's sweet spot for a lot of reasons. The enemies get tougher here, but you'll be granted access to the force field. This requires a bit of skill to wield, but when fired at the right moment can provide additional protection from damage. This is a good balancer against enemies that can resist multiple hits and who come at you in greater numbers. It adds a whole extra dimension to combat and traversal, as there'll now be numerous areas where you won't be getting the drop on enemies. After reconstructing his memories, Conrad needs to get to Earth, but unfortunately, due to the massive cost of reaching the human homeworld, the only way to get there seems to be by winning the Death Tower, a Running Man style assault course that will see Conrad fighting his way to the top of the tower against robots, traps and other contestants. This is apparently what constitutes good television in this part of the universe, and I'll give you a minute to consider the type of society where that's what passes for good watching on a Saturday tea time. Entering the Death Tower however isn't going to be easy as the morphs have infiltrated everywhere, and Conrad is very much on their radar now. To this end, he decides to approach a forger to get some fake documents made up, and is somewhat shocked at the going rate for forgeries these days. And this is where this game did something that absolutely blew my mind, something I never expected any game to do ever. It told me to go and get a job. The beauty of New Washington is that it's divided into four sections, each linked by a subway train. Each area is named after a major continent, so Europe, Africa, Asia, and America, and each has its own locations that are useful at different stages. For example, America has a bar that is useful for getting information on a couple of missions, while Europe has a job center and the entrance to the Death Tower game. While I'd played puzzle platformers with more open and less linear levels before, this was absolutely new to me. Each area of New Washington has various parts of it gated off, and these only become accessible when you decide to take the job concerning them. Conrad begins by acquiring a work permit from City Hall, then proceeds to the job center to pick up work from the various stations. Each job will unlock a series of unique events, and even open up those restricted areas, leading Conrad to rush down to catch the train, and head on over to the nearest stop to the objective. And if you do happen to miss the train, you're gonna have to wait for the next one. Yeah. Immersion. This is such a great use of level design here though. By having the player constantly come back to the job center to pick up new jobs, the developers managed to recycle a lot of the space in the environments without making backtracking grindy. They also threw in a handy dandy teleporter just beneath the job stations, right next to the save point and the recharger for your shield, so you don't have to return all the way through any of the restricted areas. It's really well designed, and very tight. The jobs range from simply delivering a package, 
to stopping a computer detonating and blowing up half the planet with it. Now, don't get me wrong, I have a lot of questions about the sheer absurdity of hiring an armed bodyguard to escort you through a dangerous area filled with hostile mutants at a terminal that anyone can access. But on the other hand, I don't think I'd have enjoyed taking a break from the major gameplay here to take part in some kind of farming simulator for a while. I mean, maybe. You never know. Now bear in mind that while, as I've said before, this wasn't exactly my first non-linear puzzle platformer, it sure as hell was the furthest I'd seen this taken. Up until this point, I'd really only engaged with side-scrolling platformers and shooters that reduced the story to a little bit of flavor text between missions at best, and a sidebar in the instruction manual at worst. And now here I am, with a clear objective, performing various kinds of tasks, specifically to raise enough money to pay off a forger, to get false documents so I can go on a game show that will win me a ticket to Earth, so I can save the whole human race from annihilation at the hands of shapeshifting aliens. You know, just a regular weekend for most people, right? This was a lot for a 10 year old to deal with, and the reference to not one but two Schwarzenegger movies was showing me that games far from being just a kid's toy had the potential to become so much more than that. There's a lot less to say about things once we enter Death Tower, as it's a fairly linear ascent that pits you against these slightly tougher speedster enemies and these annoying little orbs that can soak up far too many bullets. On their own, neither are particularly dangerous, but get them together in the same area and they can become a real problem. As such, this is probably where you're going to start recharge scumming, basically clearing an area and running back to the nearest recharge point and you'll be doing a lot of this from now on. It's the final mission on the Morph homeworld that stands out the most by far though. The beauty of the final level is it really is the climax of everything we've had in this game so far. The graphics are once again absolutely gorgeous. We started with lush jungles and then fell into bland and more recognizable scenery for quite a while. But here we are on this completely alien world one seemingly made entirely out of organic matter. The desaturated color palettes and general sense of age and decay that was New Washington is now replaced with these very vibrant hues, juggling something between pink and purple, and the morphs are here in force. These endgame enemies are a lot tougher than anything we've come up against so far. They can absorb a lot of damage and can only be hit when they are fully formed and while in their blob state, they can and will hit you. A lot. It can get so frustrating that you'll likely be cheesing your way through a lot of these fights. Though, given the amount of cheap shots these guys can land on you, no one would blame you. This is, in my opinion, the low point of the combat, as it really breaks the pacing of the game. The arenas are deliberately tight to limit your mobility and give the morphs lots of free shots on you. And it's just kind of a chore. The combat in the opening level was so fast and fluid and had this great ambush puzzle element to it. And now that's replaced with rolling left and right while you wait for the damn thing to actually stand up so you can shoot them. The game changing item here though is the teleporter. That's right. While nowhere near as intuitive as the portal gun, this game has a very basic teleport receiver that you can throw anywhere you want to land, and a transmitter that sends you blasting off to it almost instantaneously. This wonderful little feature added a whole new extra layer to traversal and puzzles. Removing the danger we faced up until now, inherent in simply dropping off a ledge to see what's down there. This is also how you set about cheesing the massive difficulty spike that comes with facing the morphs on their home world. Since your personal force field is now basically useless, you'll be taking a lot of damage from these guys, and you're gonna need to teleport out of there fast so you can get to a nearby shield recharger and take another crack at the fight. The main problem here is that Delphine software obviously didn't account for every possible location a person might choose to leave their teleporter, making it possible for you to back yourself into a corner that you can't get out of. I had more rewinds and just straight up restarts on this level than I could count. But with the end so close, I couldn't turn back now. I had to keep trying, keep pushing forward, 
It all climaxes with the closest thing this game has to a boss fight, with the auxiliary brain. Not so much a boss fight as scenery to be destroyed between waves of enemies. And finally, dropping a nuke on the mother brain that controls the morphs, and running like all hell out of there before the entire planet blows up with you on it. Seriously though, if anyone has done a hitless run on this entire game, I'd love to see it. So at this point, I hope I've painted a pretty vivid picture of what it's like to play this game through my eyes. What it means to me as a person, and how important it is as both a piece of nostalgia, but also a massive step forward in that thing I love to talk about on this channel so much, interactive storytelling. Sure. We'd had RPGs since the NES, and even before that to one degree or another. Stories in games weren't all that uncommon, and even rotoscoping animations was something that we'd seen before in Prince of Persia. But here was this side-scrolling platform game that was telling a story like something out of an 80s sci-fi blockbuster, with animations that looked far more fluid and believable than anything I'd ever seen at the time. It was stunning and challenging, and brought in adventure game elements that I'd never encountered before in a platform game. A couple of years after this game's launch, we'd finally get System Shock, which was the first game of its kind to truly combine story, action, and RPG elements into what would eventually become the immersive sim. And I think you all know how that worked out. You Max might have copper wiring to reroute your fear of pain, but I've got nerves of steel. But so much of that was already here in this tiny little Amiga 500 game that fit onto a few floppy disks. Gorgeous visuals, great traversal, fluid animations, combat that really made you feel like an action hero. I mean, just look at the way Conrad poses with his gun. And that brown leather jacket, it's so damn cool. On top of that, we've got a compelling story, albeit one told in very simple broad strokes. It's all just enough all squeezed into the tiny space of one Mega Drive cartridge. And, well, since this game was so iconic and important, you might be asking, is there any more? Well, kind of. On account of keeping content on here positive, I'd rather not talk about the Ubisoft remake. Hell, I'd rather not talk about Ubisoft at all. This game isn't bad. It's just not flashback. It's got some good ideas, but it's also got every cliche of that era of games crammed into it. I've played it a couple of times, but I get bored by the time I get to the Death Tower. And they made Conrad so damn annoying. What? Wait, wait, wait. Oh, great. <laughs> you didn't even tell me. Hmm. Awesome sauce. So when I say there's more, well, Yes, but... Oh man, are we stepping into the world of some early 3D jank here. But okay, let's talk a little about Fade to Black. So, I should probably start with a quick disclaimer before we go any further. If you have never played this game before, I honestly cannot recommend it to you. At least not in its original PC form. That doesn't mean that I don't like it, or that I didn't have a wonderful, if a little frustrating time replaying it, but it's 100% a product of its era. It was made at a time before the release of the DualShock analog pad, back when we still hadn't figured out what a 3D action game was supposed to be, and while this was a time of incredible innovation, these controls are janky as hell. And on the PC, hardbound to keys, meaning you'll probably die as much from controller jank as, well, anything else. It's also a real struggle to get literally anything running on DOSBox. Now, DOSBox works fine, it's a great emulator, and the guys who worked on it did a wonderful job getting it to run ancient jank on modern PCs. But, it's DOS, through and through one of the most unintuitive and unuser-friendly operating systems there ever was. Now, as a fan of this series, and as someone who played this game back in the day, there was something magical when I finally got this thing working, which absolutely made all of the effort worthwhile. But if you've no such nostalgia to power your experience, then I 100% recommend getting a PlayStation ISO and emulating it that way. It looks better, it has much better pad support, 
and a few quality of life improvements that will ease you into playing what is still a janky early attempt at a third person shooter from back in the stone age. So I'm not saying that this game sucks at all, but it is what it is. A very early try at a third person narrative shooter, so it's got some accessibility issues. Product of its era is something I'm probably going to be saying a lot at this point in the retrospective. And maybe that's because of my overwhelming urge to forgive so much of what this game does wrong in terms of pacing and narrative. But at the same time, it just doesn't feel fair to judge it against other shooters that came out later in the PlayStation's life cycle. But okay, enough beating about the bush. We get a wonderful early CG cutscene to open things up, showing Conrad floating in space exactly how we left him at the end of Flashback. His ship is eventually intercepted and picked up by another larger craft, and our hero, much to his despair, awakens in the hands of the very aliens he thought he'd destroyed. It seems the morphs, far from being wiped out, use the destruction of what Conrad believed to be their homeworld to double down on their invasion of Earth plans and went ahead and conquered the entire solar system. Whether or not they are aware that Conrad played a part in the destruction of their world is unknown. It's been 50 years after all. But they do go ahead and throw him into a lunar prison called New Alcatraz, no sooner is our hero securely squared away, when some kind of resistance fighter orchestrates breaking him out, and there, our game begins. Conrad is slow, and he turns in an arc that makes precise movement really difficult to pull off. This is going to be a massive problem for you later on, when navigating certain traps. But for now, at least, it's only a minor inconvenience. And just like the opening level of Flashback, I really think this opening level nailed it in terms of pacing and difficulty. I love the metallic sci-fi color palette. The enemies are not all that spongy. Yeah, I guess this gun has a lot more stopping power than Conrad's previous gun, but they do have some pretty cool strafing skills to keep you on your toes. Just like in Flashback, you have to stay still to aim your weapon, and you can only shuffle forward and strafe left and right by holding shift and using the arrow keys when your gun is drawn. Incidentally, when I was first replaying this game, I had absolutely no idea that sidestepping was possible, and fought my way through the entire game without it, and my god it was a lot more difficult. Conrad is considerably less mobile than he was in his 2D incarnation. His jumping has been toned down to something more realistic, he can only do standing jumps now, he can't do any kind of vaulting, and he can't do rolls. There's no verticality in this game and you can only move your weapon to the left and right when aiming it. So, it's basic. Well, let's not mess around, it's restricted. And given that you can't rebind the keys on the PC, it's very restrictive. Fortunately, I'm a southpaw, so arrow keys for movement to my standard. Now, let's be real. These graphics are pretty bad, even for 1995. But they are not without their charm, and in a way, Conrad looks exactly like a 3D representation of his 2D sprite. There's also a lot of ideas being tried here. Like I said, this was a very experimental time, and this is a very experimental game. And some of those ideas actually became something down the line. For example, rather than the back key being for moving backwards, it's for duck. Not very practical for exploration, but well, take a look at this. And if that isn't the earliest iteration of cover-based combat in a 3D game, then I don't know what is. Again, it's not perfect, but there was clearly a lot of creativity and passion here. It's just the same with these bouncing mines that you can use to attack enemies around corners. The only issue here is, the camera doesn't really allow for a lot of spatial awareness beyond what's in front of you. So you're only going to be getting the drop on enemies with these if you've already been down this road before. Hazards from flashbacks such as electrified floors are back and just as lethal. In fact, everything in the game that can kill you has its own unique death animation to accompany it. And it just so happens, I collected them all. I won't show you all of them, but here's a couple. Ah! 
Escaping Alcatraz is a fun start. It's fast, at least for this game, and has good pacing and an easy to follow route. As the game progresses though, enemies start to get more numerous and spongy, and the environments become more lethal and harder to navigate. This was a time long before waypoint markers on a minimap. This was all about figuring it out for yourself, and man, it's brutal sometimes. So basically Conrad joins up with the final resistance of man battling the morphs. Because there's always a resistance, and they're always as well organized as the Rebel Alliance from Star Wars. And no sooner has he joined up, he's drafted into high level covert operations because this is a video game, and cleaning out the Rebel space station toilets wouldn't be all that fun. Well, I mean maybe. There's an escort mission, not the first one in the series, but oh my god this one is annoying. You see, our target is this really old scientist who cannot move very fast, and he is more than happy to keep telling you about it. Wait! Slow down, I'm an old man! There are other missions on alien ships where without your map you're not going to know what a door looks like, at least not until you've been through a few and levels like the Pyramid that take you into an ancient ruin to deal with floating heads and walking golems. Also birds, because why not? Thank you. There are also some level design problems and cheap shots. In the Pyramid, for example, there's this one bridge protected by turrets that you cannot deactivate or destroy. Your only option is to grab one of these blue health bonuses on the way over, but these don't regenerate, so it's actually possible to back yourself into a corner without realizing it if you cross the bridge too many times, and you'll basically have to restart the entire mission. There's also a couple of chase set pieces involving an invincible supermorph, and again, it's a nice idea, it just doesn't work so well when your game is this slow. What really carries over from flashback to fade to black though is the heart of the developers. The problems with this game have nothing to do with a lack of ideas or trying. If anything, it could have been more about a developer reaching too far or just trying something too early. Lara Croft for example is a character just as mobile as Conrad was in flashback, so could you imagine an old school Tomb Raider game that was set in a sci-fi dystopia and had lots of cool aliens to fight? Doesn't that sound cool? Tomb Raider was a year away though, and I doubt the studios were in regular contact over anything. But you can see here with all the ideas, there was a real attempt to make an experience that was new and interesting, that tried to push the limits of what was possible and change things up with each level, just like Flashback did. Sure, the story is... I mean, it's okay, but it's got a lot of plot holes and other issues. But again, it's a product of its era. I'm glad that I revisited Fade to Black, though, I'll be honest, I don't see myself wanting to return there again for a long time. The experience does get more frustrating as the game goes on, but for a one-time trip down memory lane, it was a lot of fun. It was a game that tried a lot of things, and while it didn't succeed at all of them, it released in a fully functional state, a complete product that didn't need to be patched up later. It told a good story and gave people a solid and unique experience, and really, isn't that what games should be? How is anyone excited about the idea of infinitely replayable grinds, and new ways to spend money in games that they've already spent money on? It really saddened me to see people defending Ubisoft's NFTs because, regardless of whether or not you think blockchain technology is a good or bad thing, they add nothing to a game at all. Incidentally, another reason I didn't cover the Flashback remake is because I'm sure as hell not installing Ubisoft spyware on my PC just so I can run it. Maybe another time. So this has been a nice little jaunt back to a simpler and jankier time, but it sure has been fun. Delphine Software closed for good in 2004, but the rights to Flashback now belong to Microids who re-released the game in the form you have been watching in 2018 for PC and modern consoles. In May 2021, they announced the development of Flashback 2, with Paul Quasi once again at the helm. If Flashback 2 decanonized Fade to Black, well, 
I'd be a little upset, but I guess I'd understand. It wasn't as popular as Flashback, and is far too janky to be accessible to a modern audience. Either way, I'm looking forward to seeing what's coming, and I'll hopefully be talking about just how amazing it is on this very channel one day in the future. Until then, I've been Sam, and this was The Legend of Conrad Hart. Thank you.